I'm going to say minions. Okay. Minions. Welcome to video number 15 in fluid mechanics. So in this video, we're going to be starting section six. Now back in section four, we looked at inviscid flows to understand the basic relationship between pressure and velocity. Well, now in sections six and seven, we're going to be looking at viscous flows. And we're actually going to be looking specifically at the role that friction plays in these flows. And so in section six, we're looking at what's called internal flows. So flows like through pipes and ducts. And then in section seven, we're going to look at what are called external flows. So those would be like flows over objects. And so in this video here, I'm going to be starting the flow through pipe section. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what we expect to learn in this section uh, and also some of the basic things we need to know to be able to talk about flows through pipes. Okay, so here's the breakdown of section six. As usual, we'll be covering the text that's in white. And there's a lot of material here, so I don't have all the sections listed here right now. But these first few sections are going to cover off all the introduction material that we're going to have to know to be able to do section six. So looking at the title here is a great way to start internal incompressible viscous flow. So firstly, internal, what does that refer to? So by internal, what we mean are flows that are completely bounded by solid surfaces. So what we're, we really mean by this is flows that are contained within things like pipes and ducts. Incompressible is next. We've dealt with this pretty extensively already. So we know that means situations with a constant density. In more practical terms, what we mean by that is liquids or gases where we don't have a large change in temperature. But also now that we've finished section five, we know we have an additional thing to check there. That's the Mach number. So generally we're incompressible for Mach numbers that are less than about 0.3. And that roughly corresponds to about 100 meters a second. Okay, then viscous flow. So we've done previously inviscid flow cases. So we're gonna explicitly call this viscous flow right out front in the title of the section here. And so we know that must mean we're gonna be dealing now with these shear stresses, or again, in more general terms, we're gonna have friction, right? And that's actually gonna be a big part of what we end up calculating here in section six is how does the friction within these internal flows in pipes, for example, how do we figure out what that friction is and how does the friction influence the flow that we're looking at? And we know mathematically that means we're gonna need to now include those viscous terms in our analysis of these flows. Okay, so the title gives us a pretty good idea of what we're gonna be looking at here. Another very important concept that we're covering in section six is the difference between the way laminar and turbulent flows behave. And we have to take a look at these two types of flows very differently. So the section is gonna be broken down where we look at a few laminar flows because the laminar flows are more simple. So they lend themselves to a mathematical analysis. So it is possible to solve some laminar cases analytically, whereas turbulent cases are much more chaotic. So analytical solutions aren't possible and we haven't figured out a way to solve those yet. Even with, with very high end modeling, it's something a lot of people are attempting to do now, but we don't have a good way to do it. So as of now, those solutions are still not possible. So we generally have to rely on experiments to get those solutions or what we call empirical relations. So relationships that we have figured out from doing experiments and observing what happens in the flow. So that's how we tackle turbulent flows. Okay, so let's dive into section 6.1 here, which is called laminar versus turbulent flow. And I think the best way to talk about this is to actually look at the videos. So the first one we're gonna look at is a setup very similar to what Reynolds actually ran when he first determined the Reynolds number and when he first figured out that there were laminar and turbulent flows. So we look at the flow through a clear pipe in this video and then I'm gonna show another video where we can see, we zoom in a little bit and we see more accurately the difference between the turbulent and laminar flow. And just right before I flip to these videos here, I want us to have the Reynolds number in mind here. So I've put it up here in the top left. Okay, so Reynolds number is rho VD over mu. The V has a bar over it, indicating it's an average velocity. The reason for that now, as we're gonna discover, as for these internal flows, there is a difference in velocity across the radius of the pipe. So to have a meaningful Reynolds number, we'll have to take an average value of the velocity. So that's the V bar. But we'll get into that in more detail. I just want you to have a consideration that it's rho VD over mu. And in these experiments, it's the same fluid that he's using. The diameter of the tube that he's using is also the same. So he accomplishes a shift in Reynolds number, starting with a low Reynolds number at a low velocity. So he uses velocity to change Reynolds number and then just increases velocity. And by increasing velocity, increases the Reynolds number. So let's watch what happens here in these experiments. 
Okay, first things first, that's not Reynolds. It's somebody else who's made this setup here. So you see we're looking at a clear tube with fluid flowing through it. And what he's released there is a dye that's running through the middle of the pipe. So it looks like ink there. And then you'll see, so the velocity starts off slow, so a lower Reynolds number. Now, as it speeds up a little bit, we'll see a transitional zone, so the waviness. And then eventually we'll have full, full turbulence there, which you can sort of see there where there's mixing across the channel. Okay, so let's take another look at that, but zoomed in this time on the pipe, and then we'll slowly increase the velocity. So as we increase it, the Reynolds number is going up now. We're seeing this transitional zone, the waviness, all right, indicating the velocity is becoming more chaotic, right, based on the die that's released in the middle there. And then we see we have this transition to turbulence now, and it just becomes a haze, so there's basically complete mixing across the channel at these higher Reynolds numbers. Okay, so that's a great visual demonstration there of the difference between the laminar and the turbulent regimes. Okay, and we can see this as well. This is an image here that shows the same thing as the video. So you've got the die there down the center line of the pipe. And then in part B, you can see this starts off laminar, where laminar refers to layered, so laminas. That means it's a nice smooth flow that's distributed in these nice even layers that don't cross each other. Transitional, we saw, it starts to get wavy, so there's some mixing amongst these layers, so it's not completely laminar anymore. And eventually, we're into this completely chaotic flow where there's mixing across the whole pipe, basically, and that's what we call the turbulent regime. And we'll see, there's quite a big difference in the things that we care about as engineers when we're in these different regimes. So laminar and turbulent flows, for example, very different mixing, very different friction conditions. So this is why we have to split this up because we'll have to do different types of calculations based on whether or not the flow is laminar or turbulent. Okay, and then here's a plot here, gives us a graphical representation of what's going on. So you can see on the y-axis there, we have velocity on the one side, which also correlates to Reynolds number, as I mentioned, because the diameter doesn't change and the fluid doesn't change. Then changing velocity, what that's doing is also changing the Reynolds number. And so we can see over time, the velocity slowly increased. We get this transition point roughly right here. And that corresponds to a Reynolds number of roughly 2300. So as engineers, it's the type of thing we care about, right? We need to know exactly when we expect the difference between laminar and turbulence. So having that transition number, Reynolds approximately equal to 2300. Now, as engineers, that tells us when we can expect to have laminar flow below that Reynolds number or above that number, we can expect to have turbulence. Now you see it's approximately equal to, so it's not an exact science. So if we're very close to that Reynolds number, you're probably gonna have to check. You're probably gonna have to do some kind of observational experiment. But if you're quite a bit above that, it's safe to assume turbulent. Quite a bit below that, safe to assume laminar. And as I mentioned, we're gonna talk quite a bit about laminar versus turbulent throughout this section. And in fact, it's gonna help us break up the section into different parts as well. So the final thing we have to discuss here in this uh, introduction section is what's called the entrance region. Okay, and this picture helps us understand what's going on. So what we have here on the left is the beginning of a pipe that's being fed from a larger reservoir. So at the far left there where we're showing U naught, as the flow first enters into this pipe, we have a uniform flow. So when we see a velocity profile like that, we know now that that's uniform velocity. Okay, and then what happens is, because of the no-slip condition against the pipe wall, so if we remember back to what the no-slip condition is, so what's that saying is those fluid particles that are immediately against the wall, so they're immediately adjacent to the solid surface of the wall, because the solid wall is not moving, any particles that are exactly touching that wall will also not be moving. So that's called the no-slip condition. Now what that's going to do is it's going to cause the velocity of the flow to be zero against that wall. And now because we do have viscous forces present, we're going to have shear. Now shear, you remember, was due to a velocity gradient of that velocity in the x direction there along the pipe. So now because we have the zero velocity against the pipe wall, particles against that layer are also going to be slowed down by those slowly moving particles. And it's drawn here with this dashed line. So I'll use the purple color for that. So that's what we call the boundary layer. So what happens is right when the fluid enters the pipe, only the fluid right against the walls is slowed down right here. And then this dashed line grows. So you see it grows farther away from the wall, moving towards the center line. Now what that's showing is the influence of the friction of the wall. So now more and more particles will slow down. And eventually this boundary layer, so the boundary layer means 
the section of the flow that's being slowed down or inhibited by that friction caused by the wall, eventually that grows so large, all the boundary layers from the wall, they overlap into the center region right here. So you see, as this thing is growing, you'll have this central region that's fairly flat, and then the viscous effects near the wall here, where the velocity changes, and then eventually you'll have, when it grows so much that all the boundary layers overlap at the center there, you have what's now called the fully developed velocity profile. So that's a completely viscous flow profile there and it looks like a parabola, we'll do the mathematics on that later and actually be able to derive exactly what that velocity profile looks like. And now it's important to note the terminology we use for this. So as we have this boundary layer, these viscous effects from the wall growing, that's called the entrance length denoted by L sub E. And then once it crosses, after that point where they meet at the center line, we're not gonna have any more change in the flow. So we call that fully developed. That flow is just gonna continue with that velocity profile shape along the entire length of the pipe from now on. So you won't experience a change in that velocity profile shape. We call that fully developed now. So we don't have to worry about a changing velocity profile. And you'll see as we break out into the next few sections, we're gonna denote these by fully developed. So the analysis that we're gonna look at is for the fully developed region. Because it turns out the entrance region is relatively small in most pipes. So there's only a few cases where we'd have to consider it. Generally, we calculate it just to make sure we're not too worried about it. But normally, the pipe flow we're looking at, the vast, vast majority of the pipe is in the fully developed region. Now, looking at this figure also gives us a sense for the types of things that section six is going to give us. So previously, we had been able to calculate a pressure to velocity relationship in chapter six, only when we assumed it was inviscid. But I kept mentioning throughout that, like that's not really realistic. It's not actually what's happening because we do have friction. So section six is gonna help us introduce friction. And what that's gonna do is, is give us the capacity to calculate the influence of this friction on our flows. So now we're gonna be able to calculate more precisely what the velocity profiles look like. So how does, for example, looking at the velocity profile on the right there, like exactly how do we figure out that parabola? How do we know exactly what the velocity profile shapes are gonna be? And that's important when we figure out the shear stresses because you remember shear stresses is a function of how that velocity changes. So of course we need to know that velocity profile to calculate the friction accurately, right? So in essence, that's what we can think of section six as doing. It's introducing friction and now giving us a more precise way to figure out how friction influences our flows. And I think we can get a sense now too, what's gonna happen is it's gonna roughly correlate to a loss of energy, right? Which we know is gonna either be a loss of pressure or a loss of velocity or possibly both. So that's what we can keep our eyes open for as we march through section six here. Now, we have a relationship, can actually calculate this for laminar flows shown here for how do we figure out what the entrance length is? And we've seen from section five that these are described by these dimensionless groupings here. So this is laminar flow here and the entrance length is a function of the Reynolds number of our flow. And we can plug in for all those numbers there. The only one that might be a little bit unusual for us or new to us is that V bar. So how do we deal with V bar? We remember that's an average velocity. So if we think back to what we've done previously, we know V bar can come from the volumetric flow rate. And as I mentioned, that's something we often know. So if we were to take the volumetric flow rate divide by the area there, that's gonna give us our V bar. Now something else we also know, so the volumetric flow rate is the area times the average velocity, but an average velocity we remember is also equivalent to a uniform velocity. So if we look back over here, we have a uniform velocity right when the fluid starts to enter this pipe right here. So we can also equate, if we do happen to know that U naught value, that's also gonna be the same as our average value. And mass conservation tells us that. So mass conservation tells us we always have to have the same Q throughout this pipe, no matter what's going on, right? Friction or not, we have to have a same, the same Q. So if we look at this, let me get a different color here. I'll use a darker orange. So what happens is because the flow near the wall slows down, Therefore, mass conservation tells us the flow in the middle must be accelerating because it has to be the same amount of Q, right? So this is faster because the part near the edges is slower, right? So we see an acceleration of that center region until we have the fully developed shape here, which doesn't change anymore. And we see the center line velocity is the maximum velocity of our flow. All right, that takes care of average velocity. One other question we might have though, of course in practice, like how long 
are these entrance lengths? Like actually physically, how long are they? So to answer that question, so we know for it to be laminar, like the max Reynolds number it can have while being in the laminar regime, we said that was about 2300, right? So if we go ahead and sub in here to figure out approximately what the longest entrance length we can possibly have is, we sub in the 2300, so the max Reynolds number we can have and still be laminar. So for laminar flows, we see it's roughly 138 D, which is a neat way to look at the unit, right? So that's, you know, approximately 140 diameters, right? So if you have, you know, one inch diameter pipe, let's say, you know that the first 140 inches, that's as long as the entrance length can possibly be. And we remember that's only applicable to the laminar flows, right? If we get faster, so if we're turbulent, we have a sense now for what turbulence means. So turbulence means there's more mixing of the flow, right? It's not layered anymore. We have this mixing across the whole pipe. We saw that dye basically introduced at the center line. It became a blur, right? So we expect more mixing is going to be more transfer of, of momentum across the pipe. And so because you have a more rapid or a more quick and chaotic transfer of this energy of this momentum, let's say, across the pipe, we expect the boundary layer to actually grow faster. And as I mentioned, that has to be looked at experimentally so we can give sort of a, a rough idea. So we know that's gonna be quicker. It's gonna be less than 140 Ds. And it turns out from observation, it's sort of anywhere between 25 to 40 pipe diameters. Okay, and get, that gives us a sense for like when we'd have to think about the entrance region and when we wouldn't have to be too worried about it. And as I mentioned, we'll break out the following sections and most of them will be titled, you know, fully developed uh, such and such type flow, for example. So we'll start using these words like, fully developed to mean that we're not considering the entrance length in that type of analysis. So that's it. That's all we have for the introduction to section six. Okay, so just a quick summary of this lecture. So we did a quick intro here to section six and we looked at what we're gonna learn in section six. So what our ex expectations are for it. We talked about uh, laminar versus turbulent flow, especially by looking at some videos which help us understand this a little more deeply. And we talked about the entrance region, when it matters, when it doesn't, what fully developed means. Okay, and that's all for video number 15. Bye-bye.